we're gonna get started. So, um, oh good, it's a lot louder today. All right. So, um, we have a little, uh, you know, a little extra time, as you know, because of uh, the weeks off here. Is everyone finding a seat? Am I starting early? Um, and uh, so I wanted to finish up on um, the intermolecular forces. And uh, I probably, in retrospect, should have done um, ion pair interactions first. Uh, but I hadn't taught this class before, and uh, I didn't uh, foresee that. And uh, so we're going to finish up with our um, non-covalent intermolecular force, uh, forces and um, interactions uh, with ion pair interactions. And then we're going to go into equilibrium. Um, and oh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, measurement uh, precision significant figures, and we'll go into equilibrium, which will set you up for the next several uh, weeks of labs after, we do this post after you do this poster presentation. So um, the idea of ion pair interactions should be relatively straightforward if we think of elementary charged particles. And as, as everyone here might should know, if we have oppositely charged molecules, so if we have oppositely charged um, atoms or molecules, um, then they should attract. And so if we draw their force vectors between these atom centers, uh, these, um, these two atoms would be attracted to one another. And of course, if they were like, like charged atoms would repel. And you know, obviously there are two cases. And the force vectors in these cases would go in the opposite direction. And this should all be pretty straightforward, but this is the fundamental nature of many of the interactions we've already talked about. We, talk, you know, uh, we talked about hydrogen bonds, and we talked about um, dipoles, induced dipoles, hydrogen bonds. Um, even, we even talked about um, aromatic interactions between other aromatic groups um, and between dipoles um, or charges. And they're all electrostatic interactions. Um, the hydrophobic effect, in essence, is about uh, the hydrogen bonding network that water forms around hydrophobes, and that, of course, is driven by electrostatics as well. So, um, yeah, so a long time ago in the uh, 19th century, um, Coulomb uh, developed a law, and there are lots of um, previous uh, works that had um, helped develop this law, but really Coulomb codified it. And the idea is, is that, you know, how would we quantify, how would we quantify these forces? So we want a method to quantify this electrostatic force. And we use this law, and so I'm going to say the magnitude of the force, because we're going to forget about the vectoral quantity. That should be immediately obvious, at least with point charges, you know which direction the, um, uh, the force should go between, depending on whether they're like charge or not. And so you end up with this law where the magnitude of the force is equal to um, some constant k. This, uh, this constant here has many terms in it, um, including pi, and the dielectric of the medium between the charges. And you don't really need to worry about it. You can think of it as a constant proportionality. And then the charge on each of the spheres so this is the charge on the two different um, atoms. So if we had the situation, we just call this atom one and this atom two, and we do this in units of units of coulombs, and we generally just use a c, and then we have some kind of distance. Now you know generally if we're using um, metric units, we use meters, um, and so by knowing the distance between these spheres, um, we could compute um, their force. Okay, so. Um, Obviously, that by this being an inverse square relationship to distance, the closer the spheres get together, the larger the force. Okay, and it, and it goes up as a square. So, I'm, you know, if you if, if you pull these spheres really far apart, the, the force basically diminishes to zero. And so, as I mentioned, you know, when we were talking about Kevlar, we talked about the possibility of having charge groups at the end of Kevlar chains that could maybe interact and form ion pair interactions. So we have, say, a group at the end of Kevlar which looks sort of like acetic acid. This is actually acetic acid, deprotonated, so we would call it acetate. It's an acetate ion, actually. Um, we'll just correctly name it. And we can have this acetate ion near an ethylamine, a protonated ethylamine. And so if that nitrogen is protonated, remember how you've calculated its formal charge. It would be positively charged. So if we had a protonated ethylamine, then these guys would interact, um, not only you know, forming a strong ion pair, but also forming uh, a hydrogen bonding interaction as well. Okay. Right. That was part of the lecture. So you would not only have you know, an ion pair, that was an electrostatic uh, explosion, but you would also have a hydrogen bond. Okay? But, you know, in, that, that just is a consequence of the fact that you have a hydrogen group there that can be shared between these groups. You don't always have that, um, but in this particular case, you would. But in any case, um, if we wanted to really think about the energy, then we, um, hopefully everyone's caught up. I'm going to insert a blank page. Okay. So if we wanted to really think about you know, the energy, and this is where you guys are going to come in here to help me, believe it or not. So if we want to think about energy, we have to do a little bit of work here. Uh -huh. And uh, you'll see why that's a joke in a minute. See, I have lots of great jokes. I didn't really mean for that one, but now I have to own up to it. So if we want to, if we want to figure out energy, remember that we, I just gave you an equation for force. And you know, if you remember back to high school when you were doing um, integrals and differentials, that if you were to actually integrate the force equation, you get an, an equation with respect to energy. And that's reflected in the fact that work, remember, is equal to force times distance, right? And so if you could just integrate the distance over which you would, say, bring these charges together, um, you could integrate over that distance, you have this force function, and you end up with a work function. And uh, that, of course, is work is energy. Okay, so that's the work joke. And you'd end up with an equation that looks something like this, although, you know, again, there's a different constant. We might call it, oh, I don't want to call it C, because that's kind of going to be confusing. But let's just call it A. And then you have your charge groups. But now, because we integrated this guy, it's only over with respect to R, okay, not R squared. So remember, it was uh, yeah, R to the minus 2 power, and then we convert that to the minus 1 power. And then this A constant would suck up that minus 2. So, all right, so now we have basically an equation of energy, potential energy, this energy, as we move these charges near one another. And so what, what one might expect is that we have a nice attraction between these charges, and it might, might look something like this? And would it be that the energy would actually get infinitely great, infinitely more stable? Do you guys think that this would be the case? This is where you come in. You know, this is a attra very attractive, um, stable energy. Yeah. I didn't whistle. That came from the front row. Okay. Um, so if we brought these two charges together, remember that we have um, a positive and a negative charge here, and we're bringing them together. So, so should this happen if we have atoms from molecules? Yes or no? Well, is, this, is this problematic? Who thinks this is problematic? 
Okay, we have some, we have some good answers. Okay, why, why do you think it's problematic? What's going to happen if we bring those atoms? I mean, why, why is this energy going to keep getting um, stronger and stronger between these atoms? What's eventually going to happen? You can't overlap, correct. So that, just like I talked about before with Van der Waal interactions, another great electrostatic interaction between induced dipoles or permanent dipoles, you're going to have, you're going to have some repulsion, okay? This repulsion, this repulsion is due to electron cloud overlap. So you're going to have electron, these electron clouds get too close together and, you know, opposites don't attract. And, you know, we've all had boyfriend-girlfriend situations, of course, and you, you don't want to overlap each other's space too much. It uh, becomes a high-energy uh, high situation. All right. So, um, sorry. And it can happen between any, and I should, I should be gender neutral, or, or orientation neutral. It can happen between any orientations. Okay. And um, so the real energy function would look like this in reality. I'm going to get in trouble now. And, you know, the stable point is this happy medium where the molecules are near each other. You know, they get the maximum benefit. You know, this is a stable point here. You know, they get the maximum benefit of being near each other, but they're not overlapping, okay? And that is what happens in chemistry, because, you know, we, we don't have infinitely small charges in, in our chemical universe. It only happens in physics uh, classes, um, at least, the, you know, when they talk about theoretical things. And uh, so these are actually physically large charges that are going to overlap, and, um, and because of that, you know, they can only get so close to get this payoff, this electrostatic benefit. All right, so now let's just get into, um, this is our class from the GSIs, to talk a little bit about um, laboratory technique and um, measurement precision and significant figures, okay? And... Um, you know, it's a, it's a critical thing in science, of course, that when we make measurements and we understand their precision, and then when we have these, 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 we make these measurements and we start to do math on them or calculations on them, how many of these digits uh, of precision are able to be carried through a series of calculations? And so, you know, I think it's good. Just why, why not consider devices that can measure volume? Consider that you're measuring uh, volumes. And here's, here's a device that probably everyone has become acquainted with already in lab. And this is a beaker. And say it's 250 mils. I'm going to try to keep the volumes of these glassware about the same. And, you know, there's some coarse, um, there's some coarse um, uh, lines you know, marking certain volumes in this beaker, probably on the order of 50 mils per line, or say the little, the little ticks are worth 25 mils. I'm not sure exactly. And, but it turns out that if you want to measure volumes using those lines on that beaker, you're going to be in the, in the ballpark of plus or minus 5% error. Okay? So this is not, you know, a stellar um, laboratory technique to get high precision volume measurements. It's good for quick and dirty sort of stuff. Um, obviously, it's great for holding solutions and things like that, um, but it's not good for, you know, making final uh, volume determinations or uh, making stock solutions. A better device to use, which is more likely, uh, you know, a more likely choice, would be a graduated cylinder. And on a graduated cylinder, you know, you have many, many lines of, um, many uh, graduations on the, on, the, uh, on the cylinder there. And from those, you can, again, 250 mils. So graduated cylinder, I ran out of space. You know, it's going to have a measurement precision of about plus or minus 1% error, okay? And that's because, um, for one, these devices are made in a factory where they're carefully calibrating. They're going to etch the lines on exactly where, you know, 250 mils is, 100 mils, and so on. And... Um, uh, also, having many uh, finer lines of gradation are useful for determining intermediate volumes. You can never even do that in a beaker. But again, the point being is that you, you get a certain precision uh, with this uh, device. Okay. Now, the best the best option, and I don't know if you use these in this class. I, I doubt it. I, I mean, what you should know about is a volumetric flask. And I made a very, very fat bottom there. It's okay. Um, so again, 250 mils. But there's only one line. There's only one um, line for measuring volume. Okay. And that line is on a very thin neck, so that allows for very precise measurements um, on the order of 0.02% uh, error. And so. You know, you could have an alternative device. It's a very long, thin tube that was calibrated. It would probably be like, you know, 15 feet tall or something. I'm not sure exactly. But that would hold 250 mils. But would that be fun to carry around in the laboratory? No. So what you do is you put a long, thin tube on a, on a big round bottom or, you know, on a flask like this. And then if it's carefully calibrated, then that single line of uh, graduation on that uh, line on that uh, neck will then tell you exactly where 250 mils is. And if you get the meniscus, you know, of your solution right to that line, then you have a very, very accurate reading within, you know, just, um, you know, less than a percent error. So that's a great device, but of course, it, you know, it, it only can measure certain volumes. You have to use a different size um, volumetric class, whatever volume you need to measure. So you don't get a lot of intermediate measurements. So what you'd like to use, and this is not drawn to scale, is a burette. And uh, this is a stopcock here. And um, again, lots of lines of, of graduate, graduated lines on, on the graduations on the side of this, um, generally um, capable of measuring out individual milliliter quantities. And a burette, a burette has about 0.05% error. Okay. So very similar to the volumetric flask, um, generally you don't see burettes that are 250 mils, so they're going to be smaller. And burettes are designed to accurately deliver incremental volumes uh, to a reaction vessel, let's say, so that you can carefully record the amount of volume, uh, the volume of some reagent that you've mixed and you can do basically titrations. And you'll be using burettes in the laboratory to do titrations um, very soon. So each of these devices are going to give you a certain amount of precision. And um, so, you know, if I, if I did a zoom in on that burette or, you know, graduated cylinder, you end up with something like seven mils and then, say, four ticks and then another tick that's not labeled, that's the half tick, and then four more, and then you have six mils, okay? So if I had um, filled this graduate cylinder somewhere in here and it looked like this, then, um, you know, you would ask the question, well, you know, what's the volume? The volume is, say, 6.55 mil, okay? And the amount of precision that I can give is I can, of course, know. I know it's between six and seven, so I get that digit of precision. So that's the first digit. The next digit is that it goes above this half tick, which I know is a half mil, so I definitely get that digit of precision. And then I get another digit of precision to estimate between these two ticks, this 0.6 and 0.5 mil tick. And so I've just estimated here as, as 0.5. Um, you're perfectly um, uh, capable of making that estimation. And that's the last digit of precision. I can't add any more digits. I don't really know with any certainty um, what the volume is beyond 6.55 mil. So I get, in this case, three significant figures. And let's say I want to make a density measurement. So I want to do a density measurement. 
And remember that density is going to be some sort of mass over volume. And let's say on the scale, I determined I had a mass determination, and that mass was say 1. Point, you know, 0. Uh, 0.1528 grams. Okay, well that has how many significant figures to it? Four, right? It's four. You guys seem to know. And this one is not a significant figure. Okay, the first zero here is not a significant figure. Leading zeros are not. And likewise, I'll just do a few examples here on the side. This this number here, which is one tenth or 0 0.10, has two significant figures. I'll just call it sig figs for short. Um, when we have trailing zeros, those are actually counted as um, units of precision, okay, in decimals. All right, so we do our mass determination, and uh, we end up with density as, as some number. We wouldn't likely want to do this because we'd be comparing a digit of or a, a figure of higher precision with an, another figure of lower precision. So we'd want to actually um, just convert the mass to three significant figures and then do our division. And we would end up with an answer like this. And the nice thing about the numbers that I chose here is that um, you can see that I've, I've um, included three digits of precision in my answer. And I, didn't, I did not include a number like this. This is bad. Um, I would have lost precision in my calculation. And I did not uh, do a number like this, which you'll see. Somebody will try to do it on one of the laboratory um, write-ups. And this is, not, this is not right either. Okay? And you know, we've all done this. And uh, the reason that you, you don't want to um, indicate false precision in your measurements, um, it can lead to problems down the road. Um, there have been engineering flaws and bridges that have been pointed out, uh, basically, uh, uh, were based on um, improper use of significant figures. So um, that's my significant figure uh, sermon. And uh, hopefully you can apply that in a laboratory. And now we're going to go into equilibria. And I'm sorry I forgot to put up a notes template, but there are no figures in this, these notes. So we're just, I'm just giving you, I just gave you headings. Um, but equilibrium is, and I'm going to write out this definition carefully, equilibrium is a dynamic, is a dynamic process where forward and reverse um, forward and reverse uh, chemical reactions yield a constant ratio of reactants and products. Okay, so that's the that's the appropriate way of thinking about equilibrium. Equilibrium, equilibria in chemistry are dynamic. Okay, that means that the reaction is not over even once it reaches the equilibrium. That reactants are always being converted to products, and products are always being converted to reactants. And many people think that because the rate of change of the reaction has reached a stasis point, okay, the overall net reaction has stopped. It actually hasn't stopped, and these, little, these two arrows that I've drawn with only one arrowhead mean that the process of reactants going to products in this direction, on my screen is this direction, so I want to do it that way, that, that reaction is still happening, and products are still going back to reactants. The forward and back arrows of this thing are still going on. However, however, the ratio, the ratio of the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants is a constant, okay? And we call that special constant the equilibrium constant. Okay, and sometimes people like to put a little EQ there to mean constant, equilibrium constant. And the, the, the big thing here, you know, is to use a capital K. Don't use a little K because little K is to denote um, rate constants, and um, we don't like to confuse rate constants and equilibrium constants. So, um, so I'd like to make, you know, before we get too far into it, I'd like to make an analogy that there's an equilibrium going on right now. And see, I saw somebody passing a cell phone, so I know at least a few people are not paying attention to me right now. Okay, and at the level, I'm going to change the attentiveness ratio by the Lachatelier principle here by making an example. But, but, but what I'm saying is, is that there's a constant level of attentiveness toward me. Okay, that's a constant, more or less. I can change it by raising my voice. I can do things to it. But that's Lachatelier's principle. Okay, so let's just imagine right now about 99.5 percent of you are looking at me and paying attention. A few percent of you are passing notes and giggling and finishing a joke you were talking. Starting before, you know, I started getting into my lecture on paying attention. So that is an equilibrium. Okay, and people are going from these two states of attentiveness and, and unattentiveness, just like reactants go to products and products go to reactants. So every time someone puts down the cell phone and starts to pay attention to me, someone else will pick one up and say, ha ha ha, someone sent me a funny thing. Okay, so, so you know, I can't do anything about that. That's just a constant, and, and, and it's constantly fluctuating whether you're in one state or the other. And I like to hope that it's 99.9% .9 of you that are paying attention. In any case, that's, 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 that's how you want to think about this. It's not static, just like this room is not static in, in a chemical reaction. So, all right, so let's think about the big, a big um, KEQ, the big KEQ case. And if we had a big KEQ, then that means that products are going to be favored over reactants. Okay, so products are favored over reactants. Okay, so that means the reaction is going to be driven. It's going to be driven to products. So it goes, oh, you can't see it. But it's going to be driven to products, all right? So that's one extreme. And then on the other extreme is when the KQ is really small. Now, the KQ is never negative. This just means it's less than one. So let's put that here. Much, much greater than one. In this case, 